Hello everyone, uh, my name is Anas and I'm here with my partners Charlie and Jonathan and today we're going to talk to you about new material, new intercalation materials for rechargeable zinc ion batteries. As you all know, the economy is shifting towards focusing more on renewable energy and less on fossil fuels, which is why we need a solution to store the energy that is generated irregularly. Windy and sunny patterns do not necessarily align with periods of high demand for consumers. This means that we, are, we need to be able to efficiently store the energy that is generated by these two sources. For example, hydro pump seems like a great conventional solution, but it's not a good solution for grid scale energy storage because it's not viable in most places across the globe. So when we were addressing the problem of energy storage, we had to target some problems, some aspects of the problems. So first of all, our solution needs to be flexible enough to work in different locations and under various environment conditions. Next, our solution needs to be cost effective. Since we are using it for grid scale applications, size and weight aren't that much of limiting factors, but cost is very important because we need the solution to be competitive compared to currently used fossil fuels. So as a conclusion, we had to go with cost effective solutions that, and not focus that much on size. Next, our solution needs to be reversible. Because when we say energy storage, many people think of disposable batteries, which are a great solution, but they're not that good for grid scale applications. Because for grid scale applications, we need a solution that is able to charge and discharge high levels of energy as many times as possible using the same equipment. So, Given these aspects, we came up to the conclusion that electrochemical energy storage is the best kind of solution. Electrochemical energy storage systems can be designed with materials that make them cost effective, able to flexibly function under various conditions, and they are also reversible due to the nature of these reactions. So when we say electrochemical energy storage, uh, the first solution that comes to mind is lithium ion batteries. Lithium iron batteries are currently used in our phones and in cars. However, as good as these technologies are, they are only taken due to their compact size and light weight. For grid scale applications, as I said earlier, weight and size aren't that li limiting factors for us. But we, this makes lithium ion batteries very unappealing due to their high cost and high volatility because as you all know, they use organic electrolytes. And of course, that cost is expected to go uh, to increase uh, due to the forecast of their lithium becoming even more scarce in the near future. So we, our goal in this project is to implement new nanomaterials that, uh, for commercial development of zinc ion batteries. These materials m must la last a long lifespan in grid level energy storage and they must also have a low cost so they can be a competitive solution versus the currently used fossil fuels. Also, the solution must be able to undergo the process of intercalation to ensure that our batteries are reversible because intercalation is the same process currently used in lithium ion batteries. Our solution must also be aqueous compatible because at such a large scale, generating, generating that much energy and discharging it to, it to whatever applications we are using them for, it, safety becomes a main concern. That is why in our design process, we aimed at using manganese dioxide and zinc anodes, which are environmentally benign. We also used an aqueous electrolyte, which is both non-toxic and non-volatile. So our customer for this project was mainly salient and by extension their customers as well. And these are the main aspects that we looked at when we were coming up with a solution. So cost was one of the main aspects. Uh, we needed it to be competitive compared to the currently uh, available technology of lithium ion batteries that cost about 200 US dollars per, per kilowatt hour. The next aspect was capacity. Uh, capacity can div be divided into two aspects, which is specific capacity and volumetric capacity. But as I said before, size and weight aren't of that much concern, so volumetric capacity becomes redundant. 
And then safety, of course, becomes a main concern, as we said, because of the large scale applications. And then scalability is also very important. So when we were designing a solution for us, even on the lab scale, we needed to ensure that this solution is highly scalable because we're gonna use these batteries for grid scale applications. So we use the hydrothermal method. And of course, packaging for shipping and manufacturing reasons is also important, but that was out of scope for our project. Uh, so these are the functional specifications that we were looking at. Uh, we wanted a voltage window of more than one volt to ensure the high efficiency of our battery. Uh, we wanted a cycle life of more than 100 cycles while maintaining 80 to 90 percent capacity of the battery. Um, of course, that is good for our preliminary design, but on a large scale, we should be looking at thousands, uh, thousands of cycles. And of course, this uh, discharge capacity should be higher than 150 milliamps hour per gram. And the specific energy we aimed for was 150, uh, more than 150 watts hour per kilogram. Of course, m many of these are literature values uh, the, uh, that we use to, as benchmarks for our project. The main thing, the main aspect that we focused on is the cost per kilowatt hour uh, because that's what makes uh, our solution really competitive. Uh, so for our material selection, we had two main um, topics we needed to get, which was the zinc anode and the manganese cathode. So why do we choose zinc? So first of all, it's multivalent metal, which means that it's going to have a higher charge per ion compared to lithium ion, which has a single charge, which will give us a higher energy and capacity. Um, it's a low cost material, it costs like uh, one to two dollars a pound, so very low cost compared to something like lithium. You can use aqueous electrolytes with it, which is a huge thing, because you can't really do that with lithium too effectively. Um, in this case, we use a zinc sulfate um, electrolyte, which is standard for the anode and cathode. Um, and that means that it's not going to be volatile, and the electrolyte itself is very cheap then too, and non toxic. Uh, the cathode, manganese, why do we choose that? So first of all, it's able to incorporate water into its lattice, which is a big deal. Um, this means that when the zinc ions are moving in and out of the battery, it can have a shielded charge and not damage the lattice. Um, the size of the lattice should be big enough to accept multivalent metals, which will have bigger ions in comparison to the lithium ion. Um, the structure should be able to inhibit phase change due to intercalation, so ch volumetric size changes of the lattice or changes in the orientation of the crystal should be inhibited. Um, and it has a very low cost to synthesize, and it's also very simple to synthesize, so it should be scalable. All right, so the synthesis itself, what do we do? We, mag we made manganese dioxide, and it's very simple through a hydrothermal method, which just means that we took aqueous solutions of the salts, mixed them together in an autoclave, heated them at about 160 degrees Celsius for six, six to 12 hours. Um, and we're going to get manganese dioxide and some byproducts that we don't care about too much. Um, but what about the phase? So the, you're going to get manganese dioxide every time, but the ratio of the salt is actually quite important. And so we're worried about the phase. Why do we care about phase? Intercalation is actually going to depend a lot on the phase. So the lattice, the different lattices that we see here are dependent on the phase that we generate. Uh, the top one's alpha, and then we have beta and gamma. Um, in this case, we have two salts, the manganese sulfate monohydrate and the potassium permanganate, the source of the two ions. And the ratios of these will actually determine the tunnel or hole structures that we see. These holes in the lattice act as our intercalation sites, so they're quite important. Um, it's important to note that the K plus that comes from the potassium permanganate is very key to the formation of these holes and layered structures, although the relationship between like K plus concentration and battery performance is not something you can just linearly look at. So we need to test the phases. Okay, so we make, a, we make the man manganese dioxide. How do we actually turn that into like a cathode material we're gonna use? So there's four components we add into this. We use the, the powdered manganese, we use a conductive additive, in this case we use carbon black, a small amount, 8 to 1 ratio. Uh, PVDF we use as a binder that allows us to get a, um, uh, it allows us to bind the elements together and provide adhesion between the film and cohesion to the rough titanium we use as the base. And finally we use NMP as our solvent because it allows us to dissolve all the materials to make a uniformly distributed electrode on the surface of the rough titanium. And it's important to note that the NMP dissolves away so it's not in the final product and that's vacuum uh, sealed away so there's not a safety concern there. Um, and then once we get this slurry, we mix it up, we get the slurry for about an hour or so, and then we use a doctor blade to spread it on the surface of the rough titanium, which is seen here. Now this needs to be dried, and then it would be cut into pieces and put into test cells. 
So it tests all itself. So there's an example we have here. Um, very simple design just to test different uh, formulations. So basically the top of it, we've got a plastic cover on it. We've got titanium current collectors on either side of the uh, anode and cathode. And then we've got anode and cathode. And then the, we use the filter paper separator as it was available in the lab test to use quickly. Um, and then the bottom, you see a picture of what it looks like in real life, and I just showed you. And basically the top and bottom screws that will be there in the middle are used as the actual electric contacts. Okay, so let's get into some results. So first, we, well, once we made our batteries, we did some cycling, and we wanted to look at them under SEM to kind of validate some of our phase uh, assumptions about the different ratios that we were using. Um, actually, can you go back quickly a couple slides to the phase thing? Because I didn't, I didn't talk about that. Yeah, so we use these ratios here to determine, uh, to generate our different phases, which is from literature. Um, basically, we are generating MN1, 2, and 3 samples from these ratios, and those are targeting alpha, beta, and gamma, respectively. One more. One more. Okay, so MN2 here, this was like beta target phase, MN1 is alpha. We weren't able to get a super high resolution picture that we wanted to get, but what we see is a rod-like structure forming that's a couple hundred nanometers. Um, and this is important because this, is, uh, this agrees with literature, essentially, so we're, we're generating the nanostructure that we expect to see. It's hard to see from the MN1 cycle, uh, the NM1 data. This is supposed to be an alpha phase and the left is supposed to be beta phase. They actually have a pretty similar structure. We couldn't get a nice high resolution picture of it. Um, and they should have the same rod-like structure we see from literature, although it's, it's similar but not exactly the same. Um, and then MN2, we also took a picture of that post-cycling. So we could see once we've added in the binders and cycled it for an amount of time, what does it look like? So we kind of get this porous structure going on. Now this isn't necessarily bad. This is just what the cathode looks like after it's been cycled. We wanted to kind of get a before-after comparison. Um, it's important to know that if we had high resolution, yeah, we would see that uh, alpha and beta look kind of more similar than maybe it looks here. Um, what we need to do to follow up with this is to get some XRD data to measure the degree of crystallinity, which we could not get in time. Um, and this would confirm for us for sure that we made beta, alpha, and gamma phases. Okay. Here you go. All right, so to the right here, we can see our experimental capacity fade for our three samples. Uh, we averaged the three best of each of the target phases, so we made five of each phase. Uh, we can see that MN2 was a clear winner here. It faded the slowest, and that's very good. However, we do see a very rapid fade for the first 20 cycles in all three cases, and it doesn't really stabilize until after the 30th cycle. But at that point, we've already lost most of our capacity, so that's far from ideal. So much more work needs to be done there. Uh, at the bottom, we have a voltage versus time graph to give an example of what the cycling looked like and the time scale that it takes. Uh, so in this case, we had a voltage window from 1.9 volts to 5 volts. Uh, one thing you can also note here is the actual period of the first cycle is the widest, and then as the cycles continue, the period shrinks. Uh, that's related to the capacity fade as well. And you can also note that the actual amount that it's fading is also decreasing. So the battery is stabilizing over time. All right, so the next thing we looked at was max power. So here we took the highest power for one cycle for the phases we made, and then we compared that to the actual mass loading in the battery, and we got our spe max specific energy. Uh, the good news about this is they all have about the around the same power, and they're all above 100 uh, watt hours per kilogram. And uh, literature has noted that lithium ion is between 100 to 265 watt hours per kilogram. So it shows that our experimental battery is uh, competitive with lithium. Uh, so some of our failure modes here as we take apart the cathodes post-cycling. Uh, so the first picture here, yeah, we have our anode. Uh, and uh, we can see up there, there's some holes. And there's also a lot of uh, buildup on it here. Uh, so that's uh, not very good. We think the holes in the zinc could mean that there's zinc getting trapped in the cathode that's not actually able to go back to the anode. And then as this happens, it decreases the amount of ions in the system and also decreases how much zinc our cathode can capture. So that could be one of the reasons for our rapid capacity fade. Uh, it's also worth to note that our separator also has these black marks, which could be dendrites. And the dendrites have the ability to basically directly connect the anode and the cathode, in which case uh, you lose a lot of your capacity because it's no longer protected by the buffer. Uh, next one. Okay, so uh, one more failure mode we had um, was cathode cracking. Uh, so this occurs if we, after we oven dry the cathode and you let it sit outside for a few days in the atmosphere. Uh, so you can see here, this is like very smooth and uniform, like a matte black, and this has lots of little 
rivets and cracks in it. So this led us to believe that right after you dry it in the oven, you should cut it up and assemble it into the cell. Uh, I don't think that would be a major problem from a commercial perspective because typical manufacturing lines are fairly rapid and things go from one step to the other. Uh, so for our costs here, uh, we have two different models to cover our costs. Uh, we have experimental and commercial. Uh, the experimental costs are based on our actual material usage in the lab, and therefore it is highly uh, precise and accurate to what we did. Uh, the good news about this is we were able to get it to below a dollar, so this means like, from a research perspective, funding this project is very affordable, and we would be able to test many iterations at a low cost. Uh, for the commercial estimate, we decided to source a lot of our products from bulk vendors on the internet and increase the scale of what we were purchasing. Uh, this allowed us to drive the cost down by about a tenth, which is highly attractive. Uh, we also calculated our dollars per kilowatt hour. Uh, so for the experimental one, it's not really too useful. It's very outrageous. But for the commercial one, it is uh, quite reasonable and definitely competitive with lithium. All right, so some recommendations for moving forward with this project are definitely uh, optimizing the initial salt concentrations to hit the phase we want. That gives us the best performance. Uh, in addition to that, you could also add dopants. Uh, they also affect crystal structure quite a bit, and our synthesis method allows for an easy addition to dopants. Unfortunately, uh, due to the scope of our project, we didn't uh, do a lot of dope testing uh, for that. Uh, we could also change the binder type and ratio and the carbon black ratio. Uh, these are, there's a lot of uh, stuff out there from industry for this, so a lot of work would have to be done uh, looking into that to see what would be the best. Uh, you could lower costs because we used uh, carbon black uh, and that's very expensive to get connectivity, so there's possibly uh, cheaper alternatives that we could use. Uh, another thing we can do is um, introduce additives into the electrolyte solution that are known to suppress dendrite formation. This will obviously increase our costs, however, it may be worth it if the performance increases more than the cost. All right, uh, thank you guys for listening. I'd like to thank everyone who took the time here today to be here. And I'd now like to open the floor to questions.